what's important is if you do spot a flying fish on the surface, kind of see what direction they're facing. And you can kind of predict that flight path that way. So during the day, you can find flying fish offshore, usually singularly, running away from large sport fish. But the theory is, at night, that they will come close to shore for spawning. So that's why we stay nice and close to shore, go nice and slow, try to find a couple of fish, and hopefully we get a couple of sea lions around the boat. They kind of help us do the tour for us. Uh, so these fish, they're coming close to shore for spawning, which means that the females are trying to lay their eggs. So what the females are looking for are any patches of debris. They're looking for kelp patties, palm fronds, anything basically floating on the surface of the water. The flying fish are looking for to lay those eggs. They want to swim through that debris patch, lay those eggs with that sticky filament, gives those eggs something to stick onto, rather than just dispersing them out here in the open ocean. But it's kind of like a tragic dance. These fish have to get up out of the water fast enough and far enough to evade marine predators and then get back into the water fast enough before they're gobbled up by one of these large marine birds, just like this brown pelican that we have out here on the right-hand side. Flying fish might be a little bit too big for this one to eat, but he'll be just fine eating all these other little tops melting sardines that we can see all sizzling on the surface out here. But that's why every night's a little bit different. They come up close to shore, but we never really know how close that is. Sometimes they are all tucked along the shoreline really close to the beach, and then sometimes there's a bunch of kelp out there on the offshore side. So we never really know, so you just have to keep your eyes out. And like I said before, they don't fly, they will glide. What happens is these fish will build up great speed of around 30 to 40 miles per hour right before they hit the surface of the water at that perfect angle to hopefully achieve flight. Some unsuccessful flights are only a couple of feet, but the most successful flights for these fish can be upwards of 100 yards. Oh, wow. And a lot of times on this trip, we do see some unsuccessful flights, especially if they're reacting to the cyclone. They're gonna get really scared really quickly, jump up out of the water, realize there's not a sea lion behind them, and then they're gonna get back into the water and conserve that energy. It's a very traumatic experience for these fish to jump up out of the water. They're using most of, if not all of their energy to build up that speed to achieve that flight. It's estimated that the California flying fish can have somewhere between three to five very successful flights in a single night. So sometimes what happens is if they fly and they're totally exhausted, they'll jump up, have a really good flight. Sometimes the sea lions are able to track them down once they land and they're pretty exhausted. You might see a flying fish jump straight up in the air only a couple of feet. And that's just them using that last little percentage of energy to try and get away. And they are going for distance, not height. So they want to go as far away as they can, not as high in the air as they can. And the reason that we kind of just stop here for a couple seconds is because another good thing about the fish and this tour is that they do tend to travel in schools. So if we see one or two fish and we have sea lions around, we usually hang around for a couple of seconds, hoping that the sea lions can help us find a couple more fish. The water's pretty clear out here right now. You can actually see all those little bait fish floating on the surface out there, and you can actually see that bladder kelp all the way through the water there. And I think that we've had at least one on either side of the boat, the sea lions. They are sea lions, not seals. People tend to use those terms interchangeably, but they're two completely different species. Uh, we do see both around Catalina Island. We see the California sea lions like we've seen out here tonight. And then you can also find harbor seals along the coast here on Catalina Island. But pretty much on this trip, we only see the sea lions. A couple of differences are that these sea lions are larger. California, or female California sea lions around two, 300 pounds, fully grown. The harbor seals that we have around the island are lucky to get around 200 pounds, the biggest ones you'll see. But the male California sea lions, like we could see out here tonight, they can be upwards of 800 pounds, fully grown. So they're humongous marine mammals. 
And another difference between the seals and sea lions are that these sea lions have much larger front fins or flippers that they can actually use to walk on land. Whereas the harbor seals have much smaller front fins or flippers that they use more like a rudder to help them steer while they're swimming. These sea lions actually have articulating elbows. There's a good one out there on the right. And a good thing about these sea lions is that they will tend to silhouette their prey, which is basically just a fancy way of saying that they try and strike from below. So the sea lions will get a little bit underneath the surface, they'll find that fish, go right from underneath it, and it gives that fish a chance to jump up out of the water. Another way to help you identify these flying fish, as opposed to the other, the other bait fish that we could see out here tonight, is by their brilliant camouflage. A lot of these other fish are just silver, but these flying fish have a dark midnight blue top and then a white silver belly. So if you see a silver fish, probably not a flying fish, but if you see that blue top, it's a pretty good sign it could be a flying fish. That blue top disguises them in the water from predators from above. It blends right in with the ocean. Then that white silver belly, especially during the day, blends right in with the sun or the sky. Looks like you have a little female sea lion uh, making a good meal out of a flying fish out here. We believe that the sea lions are targeting these flying fish. Absolutely, they would eat tons of these other little bait fish, but they like the flying fish because they're so big. You get the most bang for your buck, maximum caloric intake. We say that the California flying fish are kind of like the double bacon cheeseburger of bait fish, whereas all these other little ones are kind of like the leftover french fries that you find at the bottom of the bag. But these sea lions don't have hands to eat that double bacon cheeseburger like we do. So what you might see happen is that these sea lions will catch a flying fish, bring it up to the surface, and start breaking it up into more bite-sized pieces. The goal for the sea lions is to catch these flying fish head first so that the spines don't catch down their throat, and then they're able to swallow them whole. Absolutely, these sea lions could catch much larger fish. They're fast enough, they're strong enough, but it's really hard for them to get that big yellow tail or calico bass all the way down. So you will see them catch larger fish during the day every once in a while, and then it uh, just takes a little bit more effort. They prefer that bite-sized meal. And these sea lions are primarily nocturnal hunters, and we can pretty much see why firsthand here tonight for the abundance of bait fish so close to shore at night. We kind of say that these sea lions are kind of like teenagers. They usually sleep all day and then eat all night. So they're gonna try and eat as much as they possibly can, especially the females that have just uh, given birth and they have some young ones that they have to provide that milk. And we do end up seeing many more female sea lions as compared to males. Uh, because they are what we call a harem species, which means that there's usually about one or two dominant males to about every dozen or so females. So sometimes on this trip, we will have a whole harem out here that's trying to hunt with the cyclone. You'll have all these females and then that one big dominant male. And then sometimes on this trip as well, you can see some juvenile sea lions. There might actually be a couple out here tonight. And what happens with them is the juvenile sea lions are actually learning how to hunt. You'll see the larger females be pretty successful at catching these flying fish. You'll probably see them get a couple dozen if they're lucky. But you might see those smaller ones get really close right behind the fish and then just miss it by a hair because they're just still learning. Might be able to see a couple of examples tonight. So like I said, the most successful flights are upwards of 100 yards, but they're not necessarily in the air that whole entire time. What happens is the fish will get up out of the water, have a pretty successful flight, and then they dip back down close to the surface and they will rapidly beat their caudal fin, which is a fancy way of saying their tail. They'll rapidly beat that tail fin and they'll kind of dance on the surface almost like an ice skater. Helps them get a couple extra yards out of that flight. There's not necessarily any perfect conditions for a good or bad flying fish night. I have and have not seen them in almost every type of condition. Some people say a dark light, dark, dark night like tonight is pretty good. 
because a lot of people think that the darker it is, the more approachable the fish are to get close to shore because they know that it's night. Some people think that if it's a full moon that these fish will get confused and they might think that the sun is still out, but I've seen them on a full moon. But the good thing about tonight is that it is fairly calm, so if these fish do get up out of the water, they have a pretty good chance for a successful flight. Sometimes we do come out here when it's a little bit choppy, and uh, you'll, you'll see that fish get up out of the water, be ready for a very successful flight, and then they just crash right into the crest of the next wave. Did one get in the boat? If we have one go in the boat, please don't throw it back. We're gonna keep it. We're gonna take pictures with it if we get one in the boat. Usually what happens also is once they hit the deck of the cyclone, they break that mucus membrane and uh, they're pretty much a free meal for the sea lions anyway. So I'll come up and grab it. Just give me one second.
are making our way down Pebbly Beach Road. This is the longest road in Avalon that leads up to our industrial area. And we can see that industrial area starting just ahead of us there, 12 o'clock. You can also notice there's a couple of boats that are anchored along the shore here. It is free to anchor your boat outside of Avalon Harbor, but you do not have the assistance of the Avalon Harbor Department. If you have any unexpected equipment failure or unexpected weather, if you're anchored outside the harbor, you're pretty much on your own, but it is free, so a lot of people do take advantage of that. And with that said, there's quite a few sunken sailboats right underneath us here as we made our way down Pebbly Beach Road. If we get a close enough look at some of these sea lions, you can see that they are very closely related to bears and dogs have very similar facial features, have that same kind of nose, mouth, teeth, and eyes. Almost have that cute puppy dog face, so they're very, very fast. If you ever see a sea lion on land, they're pretty awkward, especially harbor seals, but the sea lions are also a little bit awkward on land, but when you see them in the water, they're almost like a really big fish. They can change direction really quickly, move back and forth, and if you think about it, these flying fish are getting around 30 miles an hour. Imagine how fast the sea lions are if they're able to catch up to them right before they hit the surface. Yeah, it's usually uh, pretty rare that we get a fish in the boat. We kind of think that there's some type of force field around the cyclone here. A lot of times we've had them fly over the boat or right next to the boat. This boat does have a little bit of flare to the bow, which uh, kind of makes it hard to see the flying fish if they're really close to the boat. But if you go on this boat during the daytime, you're going to be happy with that design. It kind of keeps you a little bit more dry. And usually, I don't think it happened tonight, but usually what happens is if we do get a fish on the boat, it usually lands on somebody that's wearing a plain white t-shirt, and then you kind of have a new uh, little logo on your shirt, and you're probably going to smell like a flying fish uh, for the rest of the night, and I probably will right now after I just pick that one up. So, first stop in the industrial area, off here on our right-hand side, this is the freight lines. This is what brings, or this is where all the supplies come into Avalon. The barge brings everything to Avalon. Uh, everything from band-aids for the hospital, pencils for the school, food for bonds, everything but mail is brought to Catalina Island by boat. And that barge will pull up right there at that dock. Stays in here, unloads all those tractor trailers. So that's why when you go to Vons, you see that gallon of milk. It's going to be a little bit more expensive than it is in Long Beach. And it's also going to be a little bit closer to the expiration date because it has to spend that couple extra uh, potential one or two days on the barge to get over here. And then you have to pay for that, what we call the barge charge or barge fee. That's why me and my wife, we don't buy vegetables for the whole week. We should go to Vons every day and get a different little piece of broccoli here.